Geographic Learning Senior, and he has an ELT Academic Consultant for Latin America. Also, he holds a Bachelor's in TAFO from Universidad Autónoma de Sinaloa in Mexico. He has a degree in Teacher Development from the College of St. Mark and St. John in Plymouth, UK. Um, remember that after this session, we're going to have a lunch break, and after the lunch break, then we're going to see each other here at 2.30, okay? About 2.30, but not in the Coliseum, but in the other side for concurrent sessions, okay? About research results and about uh, pedagogical experiences. So please welcome Jair coming from Mexico. Good afternoon. How are you? Oh, good morning still. I know, sorry, I just have no clue about the time of the day. I don't even know where exactly I am in the world. No, no, I do. Uh, no, but I was telling the audience of my previous workshop how, um, in a very um, bizarre sort of way, this morning I woke up, I opened up my eyes, and for more than a minute I had no clue on where I was. I was like, Okay, now where in the world am I? And then I realized, ah, I'm in Bucaramanga, now I know. And then I, I used this sort of excuse. I, 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 I woke up at 4 a.m., I jumped right into the shower, and then I jumped into a car and they drove me here. So if I any point with my session today, I, I tried to make no sense at all, like to the fact that I've been up since 4 a.m. So it's not that I typically make no sense, but it's just that I've been up for, um, um, I, I woke up in an awfully early sort of like, um, uh, time. But anyways, um, as I've heard before, my name is Jayu. I work for National Geographic Learning. National Geographic Learning is um, the educational arm, um, the educational department of the National Geographic Society. I'm sure you're familiar with NetGeo. I'm sure you've um, probably read a National Geographic magazine before or maybe watch a documentary about National Geographic on cable TV. Well, that's the same organization that I've worked for. Uh, but I work for the Learning Division, which is the one that takes all the content that, that National Geographic has produced during 130 years of history and transform that content into educational materials for teaching and learning. In my particular desk, what I produce, being, uh, being the linguist and language teacher myself, what I produce are my English language teaching materials with National Geographic content. Okay? And what we're going to talk about today has a lot to do with what I do with NatGeo, which is researching, observing, analyzing different teaching processes throughout Latin America, and then create projects for publication that for publications that leverage the content of National Geographic for teaching purposes, right? And uh, I'm going to first ask you to open up this session. Um, I'm going to ask you to do something for me. Um, take a look at this image. It's, it's a bit blurry, and I apologize. I apologize for the sun, right? But anyways, um, take a look at the image here. What do you see? What can you see on that image? What is that? The Earth. It's planet Earth. Very good. And then it reads 21st century, right? I'm going to challenge you in a minute to think of three words that you would use for describing your 21st century students nowadays. What three words would you use? What three characteristics would you name out? for describing your students, the ones you, the ones you teach on a daily basis uh, nowadays. What makes your students different to the ones you had 10 years ago, 15 years ago, or if, if, if you haven't been teaching for that long, what makes your students different to the kind of student you were 10 years ago, right? Three words for describing students in this 21st century. Three words could be adjectives, for example, for describing students. Be as honest as possible, brutally honest. I don't look for kind words, but I want to hear the real deal. What are the words you use for describing your students nowadays? Off you go, you have a minute. 
you can talk to the person next to you if you need it to. Okay?
they're content seekers or content demanders nowadays, right? They demand for content in a rapid way. That's one thing. Another characteristic is a sense, a notion of empowerment. Students nowadays come with a lot of power to class, which is a thing that we didn't observe among students 10, 15, let alone 20 or 30 years ago. Empowerment comes from knowledge. Remember the old saying, he who has the knowledge holds the power. Very good. He who has the knowledge holds the power. And for centuries, for centuries, knowledge was exclusive to a minority. Very few people were the holders of knowledge, right? Think of this idea. Not that long ago, even only a few years ago, particularly at some rural communities in Latin America, there were three members of such communities that were considered to be the most important people in town. Three members of a community that were revered as very important, very smart people that really ruled the development of that community. Who were those? The priest, that's one, very good. Who else? The mayor, not really. Politicians have never enjoyed uh, such prestige, actually. But it's the priest, the teacher, and the doctor. Very good. The, the priest, the teacher, and the doctor. They're typically the most important members of the community because politicians come and go. But doctors, priests, and teachers are typically for good at communities, particularly again at rural communities. What's the one thing they shared in common? Knowledge, exactly. They were the holders of knowledge. Knowledge belonged to the doctors, the priests, and the teachers. The priests have all the spiritual knowledge, your connection to God, right? The doctor had the knowledge to keep you or give your health back to you. And the teachers had all the academic knowledge. So depending on the kind of problem or situation you found yourself immersed in, you would look for assistance with the doctor, the teacher, or the priest. They were the ones in power because they were the holders of knowledge. With the advent of the internet and the accessibility that people had to come to the knowledge, such power that doctors, teachers, and priests enjoyed in the past has shifted to the masses. They're no longer in power anymore. You don't see kids out of high school dying to become teachers or priests, not even doctors anymore, because they think to get a medicine degree takes an awfully long time, right? They rather become technicals on something or technicians on something rather than going for like 12 years to college in order to get your medical degree. Doctors, teachers, and priests have lost power because they're not anymore the exclusive holders of knowledge. Who holds knowledge now? Who has access to knowledge? Maybe our students. Our students are empowered because of the accessibility, the massive accessibility to content through the internet. They know, they know they don't know everything, but they know they could just by clicking the mouse, well, not even clicking the mouse anymore, but tapping the screen. With the tap of the screen, they have access to knowledge, they have access to content, and they know that. At some point, they know that for learning, for practical learning, they don't need us anymore. They don't need a teacher anymore. I learned how to do a lot of stuff watching YouTube tutorials. My kid's doctor, my kid's pediatrician, it's no longer empowered. Whenever my kids get sick, I take them to the doctor, but before getting the prescription filled out, I Google 
for side effects and potential, you know, uh, yeah, effects. And I've got to the point of calling my doctor back saying, you know, I read on Google that this particular medicine that you prescribed to my kid might cause him to do this and that. So I don't want that. Can you, can you change that medicine? Is he empowered? Not anymore. Power belongs to me because I have access to content that I didn't have a few years ago. That's the case of your students. When they come to your class, they know a lot. And they know they know, or that they could know, just by tapping the screen. Are you with me? Consider this. For millenniums, the concept that whole education was the concept of tabula rasa. Are you familiar with that Latin term? How would you describe tabula rasa? What is it? In simple words, up here, there's nothing. There's a sense of empty, emptiness. What's according to the concept of tabula rasa, when students came to class, what they hold on top of their shoulders was an empty face. They knew nothing about anything. And it's the glorious job of the teacher to fill in that empty base with knowledge. Right? That's the notion, that's the basic notion of tabula rasa. Students know nothing, and it's the teacher's job to teach them. Now we know that's not true. Now we know that when they come to class, they bring a lot of prior knowledge. They bring a lot of skin that we could use as a springboard into further learning. They bring power to class. Are you with me? You promise? Cross your heart? Very good. Because I, I, I love how your heads are going like this. But at some point I started wondering, are they saying yes or are they falling asleep? So I'm going to go for a sounding yes, right? It's a sounding yes. Very good. Good. So the third concept, it's the concept of interconnectivity. And you mentioned that already. Our students are fully digital. They're completely interconnected, right? In fact, let's take a look at this table here. We live in a time when the boundaries between people are overwhelmed by connections. We live in a time when the boundaries between people are overwhelmed by the connections. Any idea? Steve Jobs? No. But I love how I always get out that as the first option and then I get Bill Gates. But it wasn't Bill Gates either. It was actually President Obama. Right? We live in a time when the boundaries between people are overwhelmed by the actions. This is the reality of your students nowadays. Maybe not for entirely academic purposes, but this is how your students live by now. They live by and for digital technologies, particularly smartphones, tablets, and computers, and all the content they can access through such um, um, items, right? That's the reality of your students. Your students have access to all this. For learning English, for practicing English exclusively, they, honestly, they don't need you. Realize this. I'm actually trying it out right now. I'm trying to learn Portuguese. And I'm, I'm already at a low intermediate level of proficiency without having a teacher. Just by watching YouTube tutorials, downloading a linguistic app, and exposing myself to as much content in Portuguese as possible. I feel like immersing myself in, in Portuguese to learn it, to acquire it, right? I'm doing this even though I'm not a millennial, let alone a centennial. I'm more of a generation Y uh, guy. But, uh, but I, I managed to migrate to this new reality. Fact, students don't need teachers to learn English unless teachers make themselves need. 
Again, the reality is because of all of this, because of that interconnectivity and empowerment and need for rapidness that we have discussed already, students in the 21st century don't need teachers to learn English unless teachers make themselves needed. How can teachers make themselves needed? How can students get to realize that to ultimately master a language? They do need to have some uh, teacher interference when teachers adapt to this new reality. This is a new spectrum of education, of teaching in the 21st century, in which for learning to happen, for English to be acquired by your students, you need to present English through technology. You need to present English practicing 21st century skills. And you need to concentrate not only on the fact of learning, but also making students critical users and analyzers of their own learning process. Right? This is the reality of 21st century education. A reality that includes technology, a reality that includes 21st century skills, we're going to talk about this in more detail in a minute, and a reality that includes a high dose of critical thinking, of research and analysis. Are you with me? How can we make this more practical by comparing and contrasting? Let's take a look at this chart that compares and contrasts traditional classroom settings and 21st classroom settings. An important exercise would be for you to try and critically think of your daily practice. Try to self-assess yourselves as teachers and try to position yourselves in the chart. Where do you find yourselves in the chart? Really, are you a lecturer or do you set up discussions in your class? Do you work with the whole group as I am right now? Or do you rather chunk your classes into small groups in order to make them work by Do you ask for students to work independently or do you set up activities that lead to collaboration and communication in the language? Do you do you go for single tasking exercises, one activity at a time, or do you provide your students the opportunities to multitask in class? Do you teach your students following that notion of tabula rasa? You know nothing, I know everything. Sit and listen. I'm gonna teach you. That the teacher centered more. Or do you Take into account your students' preferences, your students' needs, your students' lives in order to negotiate content and then aim for a much more engaging practice of the language in class. Right? Do you follow traditional instruction in which to use the book, the workbook, homework, or done? Or do you innovate by using differentiated instruction in which you bring in um, digital tools, you use video, you use audio, you use practical uh, activities with communicative tasks, role playing, etc. Et I don't expect an answer. This is more an awareness raising some practice. Where in the chart do you position yourselves in? Right? Are you, even right now, in the year 2019, an, a traditional teacher, or are you a 21st century teacher? And again, I don't expect an answer. This is just food for thought, right? But this is the reality of education nowadays. And it's not only me saying it, it's very, very prestigious publications. Apart from National Geographic, there's other prestigious publications in the world, like The Time magazine that it's very recently stating that there is a need for teachers at academic institutions to start training students for the 21st century. Because traditional methods don't make the cut anymore. Because traditional practices in classroom don't actually prepare students for 21st century um, 
practice of the language. Right? So it's not only me saying it, it's the whole And what I'm gonna do now, because I've talked a lot already, is I'm gonna I'm gonna introduce you to Dian Lothenberg. Dian Lothenberg a few years ago was named um, uh, Teacher of the Year in the US. She's a regular classroom teacher at a middle school, but he has very innovative approaches and techniques in order to engage students and use 21st century activities to promote learning, communication, and collaboration in the class. So she was invited by Ted to present a talk on her approach to education. And what we're gonna watch now, it's just a short clip of that Ted talk. For you, for us actually, to analyze and discuss this notion of 21st century education further. Are you guys ready? Yeah. And by the way, I noticed that you're a lot of you are snapping photos or taking notes, uh, which is perfect. Keep keep on doing that. At the end, of, I'm going to give you my email address. Um, you drop me a line, and I'll send you a link for you to download this presentation with the videos included. Right? So you can have a chance to watch the entire video if needed. Okay? So here we go. I didn't have to teach them 
Central American government to teach the more exciting topic of geography. Um, and again, thrilled to learn. Um, but what was interesting about um, this position I found myself in in Arizona was I had this really extraordinarily eclectic group of kids to work with in a truly public school. And we got to have these moments where we would get these opportunities. And one opportunity was um, we got to go and meet Paula Sessamagina, which is the gentleman that the movie Hotel Rwanda is based after. And he was going to speak at the high school next door to us. We could walk there. We didn't even have to pay for the buses. There was no expense cost. Perfect field trip. The problem then becomes how do you take seventh and eighth graders to a talk about genocide and deal with the subject in a way that is responsible and respectful and they know what to do with it. And so we chose to look at Paula Sussbegina as an example of a gentleman who singularly used his life to do something positive. I then challenged the kids to identify someone in their own life or in their own story or in their own world that they could identify that had done a similar thing. I asked them to produce a little movie about it. It's the first time we've done this. Nobody really knew how to make these little movies on the computer. Um, but they were into it. And I asked them to put their own voice over it. It was the most awesome moment of revelation that when you ask kids to use their own voice and ask them to speak for themselves what they're willing to share. The last question of the assignment is, how do you plan to use your life to positively impact other people? The things that kids will say when you ask them and take the time to listen is extraordinary. I'm going to stop it there in the interest of time. Um, but I think there's a lot of lessons to learn from uh, that end's uh, activities and, and practice. Uh, the most important that I, that I uh, first focused on when I first watched this talk is how she talks about the importance of experiential learning, learning by doing, providing students with tools, but also giving them a challenge that they have to critically analyze and then devise ways to face and come successful on it. Right? That concept of I learned by doing, not by listening, not by passively sitting and listening to my teacher, not by filling in blanks or endless structures um, in, in a piece of uh, in a piece of paper, but I learn by actively getting myself engaged in an activity. The reality is, and, and this is a quote that she makes later on in uh, her talk, the reality is that thousands, possibly millions of students are really bored by schooling nowadays. School doesn't even make them anymore. We talked about this in my previous talk, but some of you have the opportunity to exchange ideas on this, and we talked about how you don't see students walking down the school's hallway saying, yeah, I have English classes now. You don't see that, that, that thrill, that excitement regarding um, education, let alone English language um, classes anymore. The reality is, the truth is that students want to do They want to get their hands dirty. They want the education to be for real. Not just something that the teacher makes these courses about. Right? Uh, Gil Morgan claims that non-cognitive skills, skills, skills of motivation or resilience, are as important as cognitive skills or formal academic skills nowadays. Right? And that is something we need to start focusing on more when teaching the language. That's why I'm such a big fan of this institution. It's called the Partnership for 21st Century Skills. You can look it up. You can become members of this foundation if you wanted to. And you can download a lot of information on how education in the 21st century should be. They in, in, in simple words, what they claim is that what's needed, particularly in language instruction nowadays, is to find a balance between traditional methods and innovative methods. What's green, what's green in that image, it's core subjects and traditional methodologies. Yeah, for teaching English, you need to practice grammar, you need to practice vocabulary, you need to practice pronunciation. You need to do the traditional listening, reading, writing, and speaking 
some practices in plants. But on top of that, in order to cater for the needs of 21st century students, you need to do more. You need to concentrate on learning and innovation skills. You have to introduce students to the concepts of thinking critically in English, communicating effectively in English, working creatively towards problem-solving activities, collaborating, working in teams in English in order to devise solutions to problems. Those are the new skills that are needed in 21st century education. Practicing grammar by filling the gap activities is still necessary at some point in the learning process, but no longer enough. What's needed now more than ever is what's on top, learning and innovation skills. For students to think creatively, to communicate effectively, to analyze critically, and to collaborate effectively in English. How can we do that? Let's take a look. For example, thinking of creativity and innovation. What's to think creatively? A lot of people, and I've asked teachers about this many times, what I've, what I've discovered is that a lot of teachers mix the notion of creativity with the notion of imagination. When they think of creativity, they think of students flying high, thinking about crazy stuff, being creative. And that is inaccurate in its own sense. Imagination is what you do when you let your thinking process fly away. You imagine things out. Creativity comes from creating something. So you put that imagination into work in order to devise a tangible outcome. You're not created by just imagining. You're created by creating something out of that imaginative process. Was that clear? So creativity is not only thinking is actually doing, it's producing, is creating something, right? And, and, and we should know that by simply looking at the word. When you deconstruct the word creativity, you understand that it's all about creating something. Not just thinking about something, but creating something, right? So, have students think creatively and act creatively. Use a wide range of idea creation techniques. Have students brainstorm in class. Have students use mind maps. Have students role play, visualize, using a lot of visual input. Because the more visuals you use in class, the bigger the chances for, for students to trigger that imagination and creativity process. Right? Remember, Traditional classrooms were teacher centered, tabula rasa model. 21st century classrooms have to be more like this, in which you brainstorm, you discuss, you present students with mind maps in order to get a range of ideas, etc., etc. Are you with me? Yeah. Very good, fantastic. Have students to work with activities that allow them to elaborate, refine, <coughs> analyze, and evaluate their own ideas in order to improve and maximize creative efforts. Don't give your students everything pre-digested. Have them analyze, have them criticize, have them search in depth, make them research. They're 24-7 online. Why not using their addiction to the internet for researching purposes. Give them a topic, have them research, have them even go to Wikipedia, I'm not a big fan, because a lot of things you find in Wikipedia are not 100% accurate, but it's a good start, right? Make your students think critically and creatively by means of this, okay? Don't give them everything pre-digested. Have them analyze, critically discuss and research by themselves, and through that, you're going to contribute to creativity. 
And I'm going to fast forward here to this. Being failure as an opportunity to learn. And this is something that teachers, particularly in Latin America, are not really, they're not really fond of, which is the possibility of including mistakes and errors as an active part of the learning process. Students are entitled, they have the right to give you the wrong answer at certain times during class. Students are there in class for you to monitor and lead the learning. They don't know the answer. They're entitled to get it wrong at some point. Right? Failure, mistakes are essential in the learning process. Because that's how students learn, from the mistake. Not from you, not from the information you present them with. They learn from the practice. And when they practice, there's a 50% chance that they're going to get it wrong, which is small. Are you, are you following me? Learning is instructional. I mean, failure is instructional in the learning process. But teachers don't seem to acknowledge it. And we're always looking for the single right answer. And we actually hate when students uh, get something wrong in class. We shouldn't. We should take that opportunity uh, to make students learn further. Understand that creativity and innovation is a long-term cyclical process of small successes and frequent mistakes. Right? Embrace that idea. Your students are entitled to get it wrong sometimes. Otherwise, why would they need to be in their class? If they knew everything there is to know in English, why would they need their class to begin with? Right? So, make your students feel comfortable taking the risk of producing, of thinking creatively and critically. Right? And make them understand that it is okay to be wrong <laughs> And then, there's the concept of critical thinking and problem solving. I'm going to ask you, in simple words, how would you define critical thinking? A lot has been said about critical thinking. There's been already years of people talking about the importance of helping students develop critical thinking traits. How would you define them? What is critical thinking? Do I see anything? What's critical thinking? Yes? The way you can analyze and argue what you learn. Thank you very much. Very good. Any other ideas? What's critical thinking? Comparing? Contrasting? Very good. Comparing and contrasting is critical thinking. According to John Hughes, an expert on critical thinking processes, the core of critical thinking is the ability to ask questions and challenge assumptions. And for us, language teachers, this should be a given. Because we're at all times teaching students how to ask questions. The essence of critical thinking practice are WH words. Can you yell some of the language words to typically teach to your students? What? What else? Where? What else? When? Why? How? Which? Those are the essential and most critical concepts of critical thinking processes. In order to think critically, you've got to use WH words. You get a reading, you get a piece of information from TV, from Facebook, from Twitter, and instead of buying it at once, you challenge that assumption by asking questions beginning with WH. But when? But why? But which? But how? But what? And if you get answers to that, you can then label that piece of information as an accurate and valid piece of information. 
But if you don't find the answers to, the, to your WH questions, then there's chances that that information is wrong, inaccurate, or simply fake. That's the essence of critical thinking. It's analysis, it's evaluation, but in simpler terms as using WH words for challenging whatever the information you receive. Right? And I'll give you a very simple example. Not that long ago, I was in Guatemala, and I was piloting uh, a material that we were just about to print, uh, to publish at National Geographic Learning for teaching English to young children. The unit opener of this particular uh, level uh, of the image, the unit image of this particular unit was this beautiful house in the middle of the Drina River in Serbia, right? And we used that image to illustrate the unit of my house. And we were trying to teach kids, you know, regular uh, vocabulary about rooms in the house, furniture in the house, and the grammatical um, structure for that unit was actually um, prepositions of place. So we wanted for kids to say, the lamb is in the living room next to the sofa. Simple as that, right? That was the actual outcome that we were looking for. So we had the linguistic aspect fully covered. But I decided to do a critical thinking activity with this young children, six and seven year old kids. And I exposed them to this image. And I challenged them to challenge the picture by thinking about questions. What would you ask the photographer about this photo? Six and seven year old kids came up with the most amazing questions. They asked things like, the most obvious one, is it real? Where is it? So I, I brought up world map and I showed them what Serbia is in the map. There was experiential learning there, just right there. And then we got into even more critical questions. Why would anyone live in a tiny house on top of a rock in the middle of a river? Right? What happens? They have this natural experience because this is rural Guatemala. And they ask me, what happens if the water level of the river goes up? And then another kid answered, don't you see there's a kayak there? They kayak their way out of the river if there is a sudden fall, which I thought was excellent. My favorite was this. A seven-year-old kid asking, is there any electricity in that house? Because I don't see any cables in the phone. That's critical thinking at its best. To challenge the assumptions by asking the right questions. Provide your students with opportunities like that. The more they challenge the assumption, the more they ask the right questions regarding a piece of input, the bigger the chances for them not only to practice the language further, but also to learn the language by practice, by experience. Okay? Are you with me? So that's actually the idea. 21st century education is a mix of the traditional grammatical vocabulary practices we've discussed with activities like this. Activities that trigger creativity, that trigger critical thinking, and that are not that difficult at all. Have students communicate and collaborate in English. We're not going to get a lot into this because this should be, this should be a given to English students. What's the point of learning a language if you're not learning how to communicate your ideas through it? The most important objective of an English teaching and learning process should always be communication. What's the point of learning a language if I'm not going to use it to communicate ideas through it? To get my feelings and messages across, right? I'm always skeptical and coordinators of schools are not crazy about this idea, but I'm always skeptical when I'm visiting a school and I'm walking down the hallway and I notice that classes are in absolute silence. 
it feels like a military school. There's not even the, the not even the zoom of a bee you can hear. Nothing. It's complete silence. And teachers and coordinators take pride in that. My classroom management is so successful that students don't talk at all. Maybe for learning math, that might be a good idea. But for learning language, students should be noisy because there is noise linked to communication. There is noise linked to producing the language, right? Provide your students with opportunities to communicate, not only to role play, not only to repeat what's on the page of a book, but to originally produce their own language. Because that's the only chance they have for demonstrating and making the evidence that they learned the language through communication and collaboration. Not even through exams. Exams are not true evidence of what's been learned. Communication and collaboration of. Okay? And I'm going to finish my session with yet another video. I'm going to present another tech talk to you. It's a tech talk that has nothing to do with English language teaching, but has everything to do with what, we, what we've been discussing so far. 21st education, communication, collaboration, critical thinking, uh, uh, creativity using digital tools, empowering students to experiential learning. Um, this is Eric Whitaker. Eric Whitaker is uh, an American musician that aims for creativity, collaboration, critical thinking, and communication as the essence of his job. A few years ago, he came up with an idea to, again as I mentioned before, sorry, uh, he's a classical music composer and choir director. That's what he does. He directs choirs and he, uh, he writes classical music. So he came up with an idea to develop a challenge for people all over the world to create the first virtual choir on the internet. And Ted invited him to present his idea at the outcome of his idea, and he got to produce the most amazing TED talk I've ever watched. Let's take a look. The position of standing for all of you as a professional classical composer and conductor. Well, a couple of years ago, um, a friend of mine emailed me uh, a link, a YouTube link, and said, You have got to see this. And it was this young woman who had posted a fan video to me singing the soprano line to a piece of mine called Sleep. Hi, Mr. Eric Whitaker. Um, my name is Brenda Lucy, and this is a video that I'd like to make for you. Here's me singing Sleep. I'm a little nervous.
just the right take. They uploaded it. Here's our winner of the soprano solo. This is Melody Myers from Tennessee. Where do you 
teach, when you plan for teaching, ask yourselves questions like this. Will your students engage in sustained discussions in your class? Will they contribute a team? Will they lead and follow, listen, reflect, and rethink? Will they discuss issues in your class? If the answer is yes, you're teaching for 21st century objectives. If the answer is no, not a big deal. Rethink the whole process and try to adjust it to the new needs of students in the 21st century. Will your students be more curious leaving school that they love? Have you triggered that need? If the answer is no, rethink the whole process. Because this is the 21st century education is all about. English in the 21st century should lead students to communicate, collaborate, think critically and creatively in English. Otherwise, they're not going to be ready to use the language for practical matters in this 21st century world. Having said that, uh, here's my Here's my email address. If you want to get a copy of this presentation with the videos included, just drop me a line, sorry. Just drop me a line and I'll be more than happy to share a link for you to download the whole presentations. And if you're into, if you're into social media, if you're Facebookers as I am, you can visit my page. It's Jaim Felix NGL as a National Geographic Learning. I have a Facebook page for English teachers in Latin America. There's over a thousand teachers already there, communicating, collaborating, inviting each other to opportunities for professional development. So, if you're in Facebook, click on follow, and we're going to be e-friends for you. Okay? In the meantime, thank you very much. It's been my pleasure, and I hope you've enjoyed this as much as I have. So get ready and 